Thank you, Brother Jimmy. Appreciate that. Kind of fun singing some of those verses you're not used to singing, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. It's okay to change things up a little bit. You're used to not singing all those. I believe God inspired somebody to put them in there, don't you? Amen. Amen. Yep. Glad you're here today. You're real quiet already this morning. I pray that uh, God gets you to participate. Amen. A little bit later in God's service. I believe He's got a plan uh, for us on this memorial. Uh, weekend. We don't talk about the fact that it is Memorial Weekend, and there's a whole lot of <clears throat> skepticism, uh, skepticism about uh, when it was first celebrated or brought to uh, attention. Some uh, said that back in uh, 1865, there were there were women that were putting the flowers on the graves of both Union and uh, Northern soldiers. And uh, then someone else said, well, well, it was just somebody on May the 30th of 1866 uh, put flowers just for the Union soldiers at St. James River at Richmond, Virginia. Uh, of course, the federal government's always getting involved in trying to tell us exactly when things are. So in 1966, they proclaimed that it was the birthplace, birthplace of Memorial Day was Waterloo, New York. So since, so since May 5th of 1865, the people there had been honoring soldiers who had died. Uh, so we're here uh, at church trying to worship God during Memorial Weekend. That's the reason some of you will be off on Monday. Thank the Lord for those employers uh, that let you do that. Uh, but basically, Memorial Weekend is what designed to be uh, in memorial for those that have died so that you and I can have the freedom to come here in, in the midst of Indoor Baptist Church today and tell people about Jesus Christ. That's the way I look at Memorial Day. But I tell you what, also, it, it, it does. It also reminds me that right to our left is my left and to uh, your right. We have a graveyard out there and all over this nation. There are folks that maybe they didn't serve in the military, but they gave their life for the gospel. Amen. They gave it as they taught you as a child. They gave it as they led their life in that way. And so I hope you're thankful today for somebody that, that is, that's already gone on to be with the Lord. And the fact that you can use that as your memorial uh, time and be thankful for who they are and what they did. Now, <clears throat> there's been very little time uh, in, in over 2,000 years that there's not been uh, a war to fight. And uh, I think uh, what I read was there's 268 years of the over 2,000 that they've been keeping a record. There's only 268 years that there wasn't a war going on between one nation and another, and they declared the word war. It didn't say about battles and skirmishes and attacks, all those things, uh, but uh, war is defined as any time that there's more than a thousand people that are killed in battle. And so there's only been 268 years that there has been any peace at all worldwide since the records have been kept. And so uh, as we think about that today, do you have peace? Do you have peace in your heart through Jesus Christ? Amen. Because I can guarantee you uh, that you won't truly have peace until you're saved. And then after that, you will be continually attacked. We'll talk about some of that stuff just a little bit more. But thank God for the history of our nation. Uh, there's been over a million and a half people, men and women both, that have lost their lives so that we could be free today. So I hope you're thankful and understand that freedom is not Free. Amen? Amen. Freedom's not free. A few years ago, 19 year old PFC Ross A. McGinnis was made a machine gun. He was on a machine gun on a Humvee, and they were in Iraq. Somebody threw a hand grenade up there, and McGinnis yelled grenade. But instead of jumping off of the Humvee to protect himself, he jumped on top of the grenade. And it saved four soldiers' lives, but it took his. And here's what a corporal said about that experience. Corporal Brennan Beck of Lodi, Texas. He said this, anytime I have something good in my life, whether it's a family gathering, any kind of a get together with friends, I think of his mom and dad 
and his two sisters. So he doesn't have his family anymore, and his family doesn't have him. Many, a man and a half, have died that you and I can have the freedom that we have today. There's nothing more precious than life. There's nothing more precious in life. If you don't agree with me, the next time, next time somebody's in your lane, on their phone, texting, don't dodge them. <coughs> you care about your life, don't you? Amen? Amen. You're going to swerve over, and I, uh, I frequently get, I stick my arm out the window, and I go like this. <laughs> but usually I'm too late. Amen? But it really, it angers me because I'm thinking, you're about to take my life. You're about to take my life. Man, life is precious. If you don't think it's not, look around this room today. Every person that's here is precious and made in the image of God. Amen. Life is precious. And we love ourselves. Amen. We don't want anything to happen to self. You don't think you don't love your own flesh. What if you get your next little cut or whatever? You'll doctor it and mess with it. Get it all fixed up. Amen. So like me, I'll call my nurse wife. It'll doctor it up for me. Amen. If it's a very serious injury. Amen. But our, our, we, we, we love ourselves. Jesus loved us more than he loved himself. Much more. Amen. I can't, I can't speak to that because I can't identify with the kind of love that Jesus Christ had for us. John 15, 13 said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The human life is, is, is so valuable. It's so valuable. And I, I wish I could quote it right, but I saw today somebody had sent a message that said, Why, why does the government spend so much money on abortions rather than on rather than on adoption. Amen. Amen? Amen. Why? Because life's not precious to some folks. Memorial means remember. Remember them. Remember those that have come ahead of you and died so that you and I could have peace and faith today in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 11, it begins to mention, you're welcome to turn there in your Bibles, it begins to mention some of the heroes of the faith. Now, as I read it, it doesn't mean that all of these uh, people passed away, especially Enoch, because he was taken up by the Lord. But Abel is mentioned, uh, Enoch is mentioned, of course, and then Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. Now, so Hebrews 11, verse 13, if you tuned in with me and, and uh, you're trying to keep up by Facebook, that's where we're at in the scriptures. And those that are in the gym this morning, we're going to begin with verse 13. He said, These all, he mentions the ones that passed away, and he did them for These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and we're persuaded of them. And embrace and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Ready to pick, which means that they were ready to pick up and move when God spoke. For they that say such so things declare plainly, plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out of, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that's heavenly. Talking about heaven, amen. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, some of the things that they endured, I want to read to you in Hebrews 11. The preacher needs to keep up with you all, amen. Here's some of the things that they endured beginning at verse 33. Through faith, they subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, 
turn to fly the armies of the aliens. Women were seen their dead and raised alive again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had a trial of cruel mocking, scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, which means they were sawn in half, they were tempted, slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens, in caves of the earth. What have you and I been through for the gospel? Not near that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Not near that, and they remain faithful. Hebrews 12 says this, Beginning in verse 1, wherefore we also <coughs> seeing, we also are compassed about, which means surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endures this contradiction of sinners against himself. Let you be wearied and faint in your mind. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You see, the first place that we give up, the first place we get weary, is in verse 3. Weary and faint. In your minds, as you serve Jesus Christ in this world that's full of hate for the name of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Jesus Christ, the first place that you will probably give up, the first place that you will talk yourself out of serving God anymore is in your mind. It's going to happen here before physically you won't show up to worship. You won't show up to work. You won't show up to teach. You won't show up to be a singer anymore. You won't show up to play for the Lord anymore. It will happen in your mind first because Satan will begin to attack you and convince you of all the things that you can do because now you're not a good soldier of Jesus Christ anymore is what he'll tell you. Or maybe he'll tell you that you're not valuable anymore because of the age that you are or that you're too young. That's not true. If you're alive, you have a way to serve God. Amen. You have a word in your mouth that you can tell somebody else about the love of Jesus Christ. God to help us for not being what God wants us to do. Amen. We give up and we say, I can't. I can't. Anytime you say that, please think about the cross. Yep. Every time Satan tells you you can't, you remind him of the cross of what Jesus Christ did for you. Even more important than that, that he rose again from the dead. Amen. You tell that to that liar, murder, and a thief. Yeah. Don't listen to him anymore that you can't. And he said, you've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So let me ask this question in here today. I don't have any people in here today, but how many of you in your service for the Lord Jesus Christ, has somebody removed the blood from you? Has somebody hit you? Has somebody struck you because of the ministry? Any hands to go up? Anybody? There's one. Amen. And you're still here, aren't you? Still worshiping God. What a testimony. The Satan say, you ought to quit. You ought to give up. Amen. Thank you, brother. How hard is it to keep going? What's the easy part to do? Quit or keep going? Quit. Quit. It's easy to quit. <coughs> but he said, you've not, you've not strived to the point that, uh, against sin, to the point that, that against the enemy that, that you've lost blood from it. And that fits for 99% of this crowd, including your pastor that's never lost a drop of blood for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
verses 3 and 4. Then thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We have some veterans out here today in our audience, and I can speak the things that my father said, and I haven't asked you this question, but my father said they had a lot of respect for those men that were over them during World War II and during their training that had been in battle. They had more respect for those that had been in battle when they asked them to do something, knowing that they had already been there and they had paid their dues and gave them the right to have authority over them. My father said we had zero respect for those that were picked politically to be over them that had never been in battle. I believe it's the same way in our Christian faith. I love to talk to those of you that have had battles in your life and God has carried you through. And now you're a teacher, you're a sinner, you're a worker, you work in a jail ministry. I have a lot more respect for you than somebody that's never served, that's never been on the front lines in ministry. That tells me exactly how it's going to be. I don't like that. And I bet you don't either. I think it, it's offensive. It's offensive. No man, in verse 4, that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who's chosen him to be a soldier. So if you're a soldier of Jesus Christ, he has picked you and he's chosen you to do that. But it, just like we talked about the other day about the goat getting tangled up in the fence and places that he doesn't belong, he said, look, if you're going to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ, don't get entangled in stuff that you don't belong in. So you can be a good soldier. Soldier, don't be distracted by the thing that our enemy does for us. There's a story about two soldiers in a civil war. They were in a ditch beside each other. And someone standing by wrote it down, what they said. And here's what they said. The next battle is going to be fierce. And men are going to die. Would you pray with me that we both go to the front lines because we both know Jesus Christ. Amen. And every time I've read about that, I think of the hero in the faith that I have. A hero in the faith that I have, and I'm going to give you a chance to tell us who yours is. My hero in the faith, I have quite a few, but the first one in my life was <coughs> Paul Foley. And I've shared that story many times, how that he made sure when I got saved that I never missed a church service. Amen. He's my hero in the faith. And my, my father-in-law, Howard, as I call him, Papa Farmer, was my hero in the faith preacher of the gospel. I thank God for his daughter. That's another one of my heroes of the faith. The way this relates to the story about the men about to lose their life is when both always stood up in the church I pastored and he said, I thank God that I have this cancer instead of a lost man. I'm not going to heaven. So. I thank God. How many people can say that? I thank God that I have a terminal illness. He was already my hero of faith, and now <clears throat> then he became a gigantic hero of my faith because he thanked God that he has it instead of someone that's lost. Doesn't that tell you something about a good soldier? That a good soldier, a real good soldier for Jesus Christ, belongs to them. Jesus Christ. Therefore, he's not afraid of the fight. He's not afraid of the battle. So let me ask you today, and so, well, let me hit, I'm going to hit, I'll, I'll follow that up. Somebody here tell me who your, who your hero in the faith is. Who has a hero in the faith out here? My husband. Your husband? Who's your? My dad. Your dad? Who else? My dad. My dad? Anybody else got a hero of 
faith. Absolutely. Y'all sitting here all quiet, you're sitting in the same chair that you hooped and hollered like wild Indians at a ball game. Amen. <laughs> I had a great aunt, a great aunt. Great aunt? Mm -hmm. Brother Mike, I was just thinking about uh, not only my mom and dad, but all my Sunday school teachers I had from mm -hmm. the time I was small enough to go to school. Jimmy Duncan. Amen. Anyone else? Hero of the faith. Who's your hero of the faith? Brother James Hale. Brother James Hale. Anyone else? <laughs> you want to yeah, Cotton? Brother Wallace Green. Brother Wallace Green. Oh, okay, all right. Anyone else? Mom Hyder. You don't wish you spoke up if you don't. You can go, man, I wish I could say something. Amen. <laughs> Who said that? What'd you say? That Miss Pat Parker is my favorite Sunday school teacher ever. Amen. Well, Amen. Well, There's some in this building, aren't they? Mm -hmm. There's some heroes of the faith in this building right here. There's a pastor that greeted a gentleman that came in the door. And he said, It sure is good to see you. Normally, the only time I get to see you is at Christmas and Easter. He said, Well, I'm in the Lord's army, but. I'm in a secret service. <laughs> Amen. In the secret service, which means you only give lip service. You're not here enough to make your presence be known and to be available to change lives. You just make a little noise every now and then. I, I thought about that as I prepared for this sermon this morning. I stepped out on the porch with uh, my daughter's a chihuahua, which is our granddaughter, since we don't have any grandchildren. And so uh, her little eight-pound chihuahua barks at a hundred-pound chocolate lab across the road. And just holds this ground and just barks and makes noise, but that's all she can do. Amen. That's a kind of that's a kind of saint that we really need to encourage to do something besides just bark. We need folks that are on the front lines, amen? amen. That are willing to enter the fight and not just stay, stay a long distance away, bark and make a make a whole lot of noise. So be in prayer for those folks. So so what holds you back? What holds you back in this battle of life that we have? This battle against the enemy, Satan, the battle against our own self, our own selfish, sinful, fleshly ways. It's us. It's, it's our sin. Sin holds us back as soldiers. Especially in our daily battles with sin. You can remember what Paul said in the scriptures at one time. He said, the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. And he wrote most of the New Testament. He had a battle with sin. I bet you we have one. Amen. So about your personal battle with sin about mine. Charles Spurgeon said this, teacher of preachers in the late 1800s, I'm delighted that sin stings you and that you hate it. The more hatred of sin, the better. A sin-hating soul is a God-loving soul. If sin never distresses you, then God has never favored you with the salvation through Jesus Christ. There's nothing that angers me more. It should anger you more than anything. It's when we give in to sin and we, we do the very thing that we promised God the last time we were on our knees. Lord, I'm in a, I'm in a fight with this thing and I'm giving, I'm giving it to you on my knees and I promise you, Lord, I will never do that again. What do we do? Not soon thereafter. We do it again. Amen? Yep. One of you does. We do it again. And it makes you mad, does it not? It makes you sick to your stomach when you thought that you're a hero of the faith or you're a leader in position. Your pastor fails too. And I get very angry at myself. Amen. That makes me a, makes me a gigantic hypocrite. 
So what do you use to fight the devil? The story is told about two Russian soldiers and one rifle between them. As Germany approached Stalingrad during World War II, and they were running short on weapons a lot. But they had one weapon that is still being used today by some in the East and other places still around the world. It's a Mosin Nagant rifle, if you know anything about that. It's a rifle that's still used, and it's a very accurate sniper rifle that was made in the late 1800s. But they had a choice of all, of, all of the, the things they had. They had one thing left that was accurate and would do the job. And that was that Mosin Nagant rifle, as they called Yours, mine, is this right here. Amen. This is how you battle sin. Yep. You get to know this, you get to know more about the Lord. You need a battle plan, you tell me you don't have one, he's got one for you here. Amen. But you'll never be the good soldier, I'll never be the good soldier that Christ wants me to be until I'm self-disciplined enough to obey what this says so I can be a leader of others. And this thing's powerful. He says this in Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow. So if you say, man, I wish I knew. I wish I knew what my enemy was up to. I wish I knew what Satan was up to. Read this. He's up to no good. Amen. He's up to destroy your testimony. Yep. He's up to defeat your church body. He's up to get you to quit, get you to give up, get you to end your life, get you to end all kinds of things that you're acting for the Lord doing. That's what he's all about. Fighting with the Word of God. Quote Scripture to Satan. Give it back to him. Let him have it. He said, there's neither any creature that is not manifest in God's sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom that we have to do. So God's saying, this word will reveal everything you need to know. Amen. We're saying there's none of the dark will be revealed in the light about your enemy. It's about those that oppose you. The word's powerful. It will last forever. Amen. There will be a new heaven and a new earth someday. But here's what the Bible says. Heaven and earth, Matthew 24, 35. That heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 4, 4. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, when was that statement given? It was given to Satan is tempting Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, 7, Satan is tempting Jesus Christ again. And what did Jesus say? It's written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Matthew 4, 10, he says, Get you behind me, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You feel helpless? You're not for the Word of God. Yeah. You don't know how to get Satan off of your back? Not with the word of God. You can get rid of him. You can send him packing. You can send him away. Remind him, just do what Jesus did. Jesus quoted the word of God. Why can't you do that? Why can't I do that? Are you faithful enough to God's house that you've learned enough scriptures to quote them to him? You see, it isn't just about the gathering to get together to for fellowship, it's about the Lord and the Word of God to give you the thing that you need to defend yourself in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every time I go down the hill from where I moved to when I was five years old, I go to the carport where I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I cannot go by there without thinking of the day 
that I got saved. I just can't do it. I cannot do it. It draws my attention. I want to ask my neighbor someday, and I guess I need to do it. He's going to, if he watches Facebook, he's going to see me on air. But I need to ask him someday, can I come down there and just stand in that spot? Stand in that spot for God to save my soul. Amen. How precious salvation is. Right. The defense we have. The defense we have in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the king of our brethren is cast down, which is before our God day and night. Can you overcome Satan or somebody else overcome him for you? He's overcome by the blood of the Lamb, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony, they love not their lives unto the death. That sounds like the greatest hero of faith that's ever been set foot upon Mother oh. Earth, and that was Jesus Christ. Amen. By his blood, we have freedom from our sin punishment that we have earned. So can you say this in 2 Timothy 4.8? I've fought a good fight. Or would yours be, I ran real fast. I ran real far. I got away from the Lord. I didn't want anything to do because it's uncomfortable. I didn't want anything to do with ministry. It's uncomfortable. I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I, I hear that a lot in the ministry. Folks tell me, I, I, I'm just not comfortable doing that. And I, you know what? I understand that. I'm not at comfort as I stand up here before. You may think that I am, but I'm not comfortable. I'm just called. Amen. I'm not comfortable. I'm, not, I'm that same kid that was taught to curse at five years old as he went to the grocery as a child and Old men would get me to say dirty words and they'd laugh at me. And I was born premature, so I was always shorter and smaller than everybody else. I couldn't do for a long time what everybody else could do. You're exactly right. I, I, I'm not comfortable. I'm not deserving of the call upon my life. But I'm telling you, by the grace of God, I stand here. Amen. By the grace of God, you were able to make it here today. Amen. So send him packing that liar, murder, and thief, and tell him you can this way. I can do all things in Jesus Christ and love me. Tell him that. But when God calls you out to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ, he never said that it would be easy. He never said that it'd be comfortable. Remember when he called Paul to the gospel? He said, show him the things that he's going to suffer for my sake. You suffered for the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're more like him than you've ever been. More like him than you've ever been. Don't quit. Keep going. Keep serving. Keep praying. Keep reaching out to the lost. Fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Now I'm going to close and share with you something we use at the very bottom of my heart. And I pray that God proves all of us wrong very soon. I talk to pastors all the time during this entire two month thing that we've been through with this virus. There's a whole other sermon about all that, too, by the way. I've heard of one salvation to numerous pastors and preachers that I've talked to. One salvation. What does it 
tell you, we're not a repentant, we're not a repentant nation. We're still comfortable. Amen. Amen. The camera can catch this whole frame right here. I'm not missing me. I'm not missed out on anything. Now, I'm not making light of those that have passed away and lost their lives during this time. We're so comfortable as a nation. We're so comfortable as churches. You may not like it. We're so comfortable we still are not repentant over our sin. And until we have true repentance as a nation that's founded under godly principles, and I've said in the gym that, that God allowed you all to build until we have repented as individuals seeing our sins on a, our Savior's cross, sin in your life today and you walk in here with it and you don't repent of it you've not learned anything through all this and I've not learned anything but by the way let me ask this question do diseases save souls? no, no. does cancer save souls? no car wrecks save souls? murders save souls? no Jesus Christ says, He said, repent you and be baptized. Amen. Until we're sorry for our sin. Nothing's going to change. Amen. We're going to all go right back to our normal routine, and that's what it'll be. If you don't know Christ, you come today. But if God has revealed a sin to you that you've never repented of, the Bible says, repent you and be baptized. If you want to become a member of of this church you come. If you need to come pray and be repentant of your sin and not let Satan distract you with all the junk that's going around because sin hasn't changed and the forgiveness of sin has not changed. Our Lord has not changed. Heaven has not changed. Hell has not changed. Grace has not changed. Love has not changed. And you can find love, forgiveness, grace, salvation on your knees through repentance. What repentance says is that this. I'm sorry I'm going to turn around and go a different way. you got sin in your life and you're tired of it. Maybe you want to come repent of it. And by the way, I don't know one soul in this building, including your pastor, that doesn't have some sin in his life. You say, Brother Mike, I'm sinless. Jesus, I'm glad you're here with us. Amen. Amen. If you've got sin in your life, you come make it right between you and God. Not, not with me, make it right with God. So, Brother Mike, this is different. We're in the gym. Same love, same forgiveness, same grace. Amen. Same God's here with us. Right. Amen. 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 Get me wrong, I can't wait to embrace y'all again. I can't wait to pass the pastor to embrace you. Because you're love. If there's somebody that wants to embrace you at the altar, if you got sin, then you come if you have sin in your life. The camera won't be focusing on you, it'll stay right here. This is a private time. You come if you have a need in your life. As they sing a hymn of invitation. You come. You're welcome to pray with each other. That's up to you all. You stand over someone with hands raised, lifting a holy hand to the Lord. We mentioned that with you. You come if you have a need. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to the devil. He'll keep you sitting exactly where you are and leave this building with the same sin you walked in. The invitation's open right now. It's always open at Pandora Baptist Church. Mm -hmm.